the most hospitalizations, the most deaths. So we figured, let's, let's get the it. hell out of here and let's go to a place that's calm, mm -hmm. it's beautiful, the weather's great, they're open, there's not as many cases. Mm -hmm. We moved to Florida. What's the headline today? In fact, it's the BS headline of the day. Florida is the new epicenter of coronavirus in the United States. It's on CNN. There's more cases than ever. The past two or three days in a row, there's been more than a thousand new cases a day. Trump said it's because it's all, and the governor said it's all BS because there's more testing. But who knows? I feel like we keep going from like, we're like the typhoid Mary of <laughs> coronavirus in America. Typhoid like it's not, James and Robin. Yeah, the typhoid, typhoid Robin. Um, maybe I'm, maybe you're the super spreader. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. So, by the way, I also read, remember my idea about pajamas combined with your idea about copper, pajama sales have surged 165% in the past few months. Because people are just, people don't need clothes anymore except for pajamas. They just need comfortable clothes to binge watch TV all day. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to, I'm not going to dress up in a tuxedo and like binge watch Tiger King or whatever. I'm going right. to wear pajamas. Like, see? These are pajamas. We're nice I'm, linen. I'm, you know, he fits right in. I'm experimenting this each day thing. with a new kind of pajamas. So this is my pajamas of the day. It's like got the, the Nehru effect with the collar, the Gandhi effect with the all white. So I'm trying to be an Indian spiritual leader or wear pajamas. I'm not quite sure. Or an Indian political uh, leader. Um, uh. So, uh, I've been encouraging people to ask me questions via community, which is the way to text me on my phone, and then I can text everybody back. So, if you have questions for these IG Lives, or if you just want to ask me a question and I'll respond somehow, or I'll respond in an article, or you want to send me an idea list, I'm also going to send out my idea list via my phone, but my phone number, which you can text to, Text me right now if you want, 203-590-8607. You can find it on my last tweet on Twitter. It's 203-590-8607. Feel free to tweet me questions or whatever, and I will start tweeting back. Um, but I will, just we're going to go right into the questions, unless there's any new news. No, not for me, except the pool I, doesn't work yet. Pool doesn't work. <laughs> and I pulled you away, I pulled you away from the pool. Um, there are actually uh, one thing I do want to talk about. Like, I do feel like suddenly everybody on Twitter is either a professional epidemiologist, an economist, a geopolitical strategist, uh, a historian on African American racism. Like, and then you can't, and that kind of shuts down all discourse because suddenly, like, I'm an expert. And, and but it's all pretend, like Twitter is this place, it's like this constant Halloween party where everybody dresses up as an epidemiologist for a few weeks. Oh no, now I should be a, uh, a historian. Oh no, now I need to be a constitutional lawyer. Oh no, now I need to be a climate change expert. Well, at least it makes people maybe research, I don't know. Yeah, but that's the point. But also though, what bothers me are these people that are really mean and they don't really have their whole name. Like you don't know who they are. Yeah, like you know, I. It's like to me, that's kind of I don't know, crappy. Yeah, so like one person tweeted to me. To, I get hate tweets every day, and one person tweeted to me today, uh, like an angry thing about Bitcoin, and I didn't even bother reminding him that when I recommended Bitcoin, it was at thirty five hundred. Now it's near ten thousand. I don't. When you have to kind of convince somebody again, I mentioned this the other day. When you convince somebody, you're giving them status. And if they're just an anonymous troll on Twitter, why would you, anybody here, why would we give them status? But I did look this person up and I saw that in 2010, he was like 18 years old, he put up a YouTube video completely, um, he was dressed up as a Nazi soldier and shooting Jews. <laughs> like who were, his friends were dressed up as Jews and he was shooting them. Really? And, so yeah. he had his real name? Um, he, he had his real name, yeah. Um, it almost seemed anonymous because it was like a German name, I guess. But uh, so I yeah, didn't recognize. It was made up. It was best something. No, yeah. because then when I tweeted his name, he had an. It was actually linked to an anonymous named account on YouTube. But I saw it and it looked the same as account. But his account, the tweets are blocked, so I can't see his. I think they're just cowards, really. People that do that. 
Oh yeah, I think of course. That's my opinion. It's like if you can't say something and people know who you are, I feel like they're just cowards. Well, but and I don't know. and and look, they're cowards, but they're also afraid. We live in like yeah, really, we yeah. live in really. I know it gets. But they, they get, shouldn't be trashing people. They right. can't tell people who they are, and they shouldn't just say it because that's what I think makes it terrible is that they can say anything they want, and there's no repercussions for them because no one knows who they are. I just don't think it's fair. I maybe, agree. Maybe Twitter should just have everyone that to use a real name. Kind of like Facebook, but, but here's the problem. <laughs> that will stop a lot of. Here, 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 here's the problem a little bit. Yes, that solves society's problem with Twitter because because. We're all using Twitter now. In fact, Twitter usage has risen during the past three months. The problem is Twitter itself loves anonymous people, trolls, bots. The more arguing on Twitter, the better. That's just more reloads. Like, did they respond yet? Reload. Oh, here's a new ad. Reload again. Oh, here's a new ad for erectile dysfunction pills. Reload again. Oh, here's a new ad for pajamas or whatever. So, so Twitter loves it because because they want to. Twitter has to kind of feed the beast of Wall Street. But isn't that capitalism for them? Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of weird, right? Aren't they against like capitalism or sort of like they're against people that talk about Trump or about any? No, they're not against. Twitter really is not against anything. They just want arguing. They want as much. Well, why are they as taking people down that aren't you know? To, to be talking fair, about their narrative. Or okay, so so the question is, why is Twitter starting to censor people? They've only just started doing this. They're like the last social media platform to do this because they really, to their credit, but maybe also there's a, a there's a, like with everything, there's the good reason and the real reason. Mm -hmm. So the good reason is Twitter was the last social media platform to do any kind of censorship at all, and. Um, and, and you could say the good reason is they believe in freedom of speech and they don't want to censor anyone. The real reason is the more fighting, the better for Wall Street. That's their capitalist real motive is not just freedom of speech, but freedom of them to make as much right. money as possible without the more, the more censorship, the more pages they take down, the less money they make. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Uh, the other thing is uh, someone um, tweeted a video I saw. I don't know. I was going to send this to you, but then I decided not to. Uh, 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 someone tweeted. I don't know if you saw this. There was a, a, a guy who was an undercover policeman. Was um, There was some sort of fight. I don't really understand. because There was a video posted of this undercover policeman. And I'll tell you what happened. So we don't really know what happened before. There's like various stories about what happened before. But the video starts with all these protesters... And I don't want to, who knows if they're peaceful protesters or rioters or whatever. We don't really know. We don't know the backstory at all. But all these people, are, the mob is chasing this undercover cop. Mm -hmm. And it's about 10 of them chasing this guy. And then suddenly he stops, turns around, pulls out a concealed gun, because they didn't know he was an undercover cop, pulls out a gun, shoots someone three times right in the chest, who falls down, and there's blood spurting out, and then, you know, runs off again. And I think they caught him. And I don't know what happened before or after or why. I don't know. And but I see this on the video, and the, you see the guy. I don't know if he's dead or not. And you see just blood coming out of him. He's on the ground, like he kind of veers back to the ground. And so, um, and of course, I watched the video. I didn't really know what I was going to watch, but there was some suggestion that there was graphic content. I didn't know it was going to be that graphic. And I'm just getting a little annoyed. It's starting to affect me a little bit all the snuff videos. Uh, snuff video is a video you watch of someone dying, and again, I could just choose not to watch them, but... And how do they know he was an undercover policeman? Um, there, there are now stories about the video coming out. So there was some altercation before the video started, uh, and there's, and then stuff, I think he was arrested after, but it was unclear if he was arrested to go to jail or... It, so it's all hearsay, really? Yeah, I mean, they were attacked, the mob was attacking him, so you can argue, and by the way, they're all white people, but the mob was attacking him, so there was some justification, but who knows? You know, you can't, again, I'm not a lawyer, judge, I don't know, I don't know I anything. I know if he was a real undercover cop. I, the story does say he was an undercover cop, so, or someone who was commenting referred to an article <laughs> that said, so I don't really know. So, That's funny. but I will get That's to, I will get to some questions. Welcome everybody, IG Live, a uh, bunch of different questions. Again, people have been asking me questions by texting me directly to my phone number, um, which is 203-590-8607. So here's, um, Mitch Johnson says, 
James Love the Daily uh, IG Live. My question is that so many people are worried about cash due to COVID. Are you still paying with cash and those famous $2 bills or paying strictly with a credit card uh, now? And this person says he likes having cash. I like having cash also. And when we came to Florida, I bought, I brought with me several hundred $2 bills. And the reason is my philosophy ever since 1992 is that whenever I move to a new area, I tip with $2 bills. So like if let's say I go out to a restaurant and it's $40, so the tip maybe is, let's just hypothetically say $10, I'll give five $2 bills as the tip. The way you get a lot of $2 bills is you ask your bank, hey, can I order a, a, a thousand $2 bills? And they will call up the Federal Reserve, place an order, the Federal Reserve, who has all these $2 bills for some reason, they send a thousand $2 bills to the bank and it's in these nice little packets and you get a thousand $2 bills. But when you tip with $2 bills, whenever I move into a new area, I want people to remember me. And so what happens is if I move to a small town or a local area, then I can see how people spend money because then you start to see $2 bills pop up across the whole local economy. And then everyone remembers me on the two, even though they don't remember my name, they say, oh, it's that $2 bill guy. So because I'm insecure and shy and a little, I, you know, maybe a little weird, I kind of want people to remember me and I want it to be an easier way for me to make new initial friends, just being honest. So I tip with $2 bills. So I did bring $2 bills down with us to Florida. And by the way, we're going back and forth to New York City and Florida. Um, and I, we haven't used any for the reason mentioned in this question is that I think people are now afraid of touching cash because they think they're going to get the virus from cash. Or like if I touch the cash and then they touch it, they're going to get in trouble. Now, it doesn't matter that they give us a credit card machine and we touch that and then they take it back and they're wearing gloves anyway. But I think everybody's a little bit more hesitant to like, remember, this reminds me of, so a year ago, I got a whole bunch of um, valid legal North Korean currency. It had oh, Kim yeah. Jong Il, like the grandfather, or Kim Jong mm -hmm. whatever, uh, the grand, it was from 1977, all this North Korean currency. And some people would take it and look at it, but some people I would show it to them and they would back up, like they were afraid to touch it. <laughs> so, so uh, I don't know, I still don't know to this day why people were afraid, like, did they think it was like poisonous? Like, there would be, poison sprayed onto the North Korean bills, but it reminds me of that now with real currency. Yeah, no, I remember when we lived in Ghana and we came back uh, in the summer to get uh, all of our physicals and we took the kids to the pediatrician and they knew that this family was coming in from Ghana. And so when we walked in, uh, everyone sort of scattered and they go, oh, you're the Samuels, okay, oh, come with us right away. I mean, there are people waiting and they didn't want us in the waiting room. So they put us into this room that was big enough for all of us and then like we were like away from everybody so it's like they wanted to separate us just in case we were carrying any diseases or whatever it was the weirdest thing it's and how like, long did you have to stay uh we were in there for quite a while it was a special room but did they check for diseases oh yeah we we had i don't know 15 different inoculations we had to get every really you know, before we even moved there yeah so the you case. had to prove well, we already inoculated before we moved over there. But then when we came back, you know, of course the kids had to get their normal, you know. But shot. when you were in the waiting room, how did they prove that you weren't bringing back diseases? Like, how did they let you go? Uh, they didn't do anything like that. I mean, they, they just did a regular checkup for the kids. But it was sort of weird. We felt a little strange about that. So they used to quarantine people coming from places where there might be outbreaks of pandemics mm -hmm. and now nothing, they don't really. Yeah, there was nothing really going on at that point. The second year though, we had bird flu in Ghana and that was when, you know, we uh, I worked with the with my friends at the US um, the USA. They would go in and kill all the chickens in Ghana, okay? They would bury them and then the Nigerians would come and they found out where they were all buried. They come and they dig them up and then they take them back to their markets and sell them. Was it healthy? Did no, it? these were all infected. Did, and you were the one telling me in the US, in the beginning of the lockdown, they had to kill something like 60 million chickens because for some reason, I guess food sales were down or chicken in, sales in were down. In the US? Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't know anything about that. I yeah, didn't so, know about that. 
Yeah, yeah, so something like 60 million chickens were killed because fast food restaurants were all closed. So, like, wow. your Chick-fil-A was closed, so they had to kill all these farm uh, chickens. Yeah, we had our own problems over there. I don't know what you guys did over here. That's so, crazy, though. So, like, it's funny. Since the lockdown, nobody's mentioned climate change. No one's mentioned PETA or animal cruelty. Like, everything became about pandemic. You know, and, I, and look, here's an important thing. Right now, everyone, including me, including you, including you, we're all anxious, like the world's different and the world's uncertain. We're all a little stressed. Mm -hmm. We're all a little anxious. We're going to get through this, like every crisis in world history. We're going to get through this, but it's a little scary. And so what happens is, is that you start to gravitate you start to gravitate away from your normal routine because there is no normal routine anymore. And you start to gravitate towards what's happening on the news, what's happening on the social media. It becomes, yeah. it, it, it rents mental real estate. So, mm -hmm. oh, when coronavirus started to die down, it's the protests and Black Lives Matter, which by the way is an important issue, but is it really an important issue for everybody to go out and protest? I'm not saying it isn't, it is or it isn't, but I'm just saying like, normally in our daily lives, we care about our own health. I care about how you're doing. I care about how my family's doing. I care about my work and job and my friends and my family. And so it goes out in concentric circles of the things and issues I care about. But now we become gravitated towards one issue at a time and we have to care about that issue. So for instance, Nobody's really aware that right now there's a, a total genocide happening in Yemen. So it used to be if there was a genocide happening like in Rwanda, we would be aware of it. But for many people maybe listening, this is the first they probably hear. There's a complete genocide happening in Yemen right That's now. It's been happening a long time. Right, but I never even heard of it before until I started reading it's about a, it. It's a proxy war. Well, well, Saudi Arabia is going in and basically killing people and putting people in refugee camps and destroying their lives and I don't know. It's a proxy war. So it's a Saudi Arabia with the US behind it and it's against the, the Shia, which are the Iranians. So it's really a war against Iran and, and the US. Well, okay, so it's a proxy war. So this is horrible and yet nobody, nobody cares about that issue. There's like all these little kids getting coronavirus in these refugee camps. So, like, Yemen is going to cease to That's, exist as a country. I mean, there's so much of this happening all over, not just Yemen, but in the, the Uyghurs up in the northern part of China. They're in concentration camps. There's millions of them. I mean, there's just so many that I can make a list next time we come of all the atrocities that right. all these countries are doing. So, Yet these countries, like China, are saying... Um, oh, you know, you don't like black people and you are so, you know, all this stuff, you know, you're, you're prejudiced, but yet they're doing this to the people. Right. The Chinese people. are criticizing yes. the U.S. Where for... they, they have them in concentration camps and they won't let Africans come in to China. It's, it's horrible what so, they're doing. So it's just it makes me angry. When right. And so the point is, the point is not that we should protest about the Uyghurs or protest about Yemen. It's just that the world is a big place and don't let one thing, and obviously this is every, all of these things are extremely important. All, all of these issues we're protesting here are extremely important. Our kids are protesting. We've been to the protests, uh, but don't let one issue rent all the real estate in your brain. You still need your brain. The best you can do for the people you love and even for the issues you care about is for you to be healthy and not to be angry and not to be stressed and not to be afraid. And so I, there's plenty of, you know, self-help people doing IG lives about how to deal with stress and fear and how to be calm in times of stress. So there's plenty of answers for that. But just keep it in mind the next time someone tries to argue with you about something, let them argue and you and do like a, taek, a mental Taekwondo move. Like, let them argue and you just move to the side and let the argument go past you. Not that you're ignoring it, you're listening to it, but just you don't have to act on every single thing that people yell at you about or that people try to convince you about. Just, and you don't have to agree with them either. You just can nod your head and acknowledge it and learn, but step aside and realize that the world is a big place and you really need to take care of yourself 
First, are you sleeping eight hours a day? Are you exercising? Are you with people who are not toxic to you? Are you exercising your creativity muscle? Are you, are you being creative every day? It's very important. I wrote two idea lists today just to keep my creative muscle going. Uh, I've, I've done up to 100 push-ups today so far. Wow. I've had, yeah, some, I'm, awesome. I'm gonna break a record today. Mm -hmm. By the way, someone asked if I had sun. No, but the sun behind us plus the white shirt makes me look darker because Jews are not really white. We're a little darker. You're white. You're white. You're whiter than me. Um, so here's a, here's a question from the kid. Uh, will the Fed ever have to repent for their sins? And so what he means, I'm assuming, is the Federal Reserve is printing up all this money, is bailing out all these industries, is, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government are gonna spend trillions of dollars. And I've answered this before, when, they, when you say repent for their sins, what you're really asking is, will the dollar collapse and there will be hyperinflation? And the answer is, in the very short term, which means one to five to 10 years, the answer is no. And the reason is, it's no problem for us to pay back the debt because it's almost at 0% interest rates. If you, if you were to borrow money at 0% interest rates, you would be able to do it. And we're borrowing a huge amount of money right now at 0% interest rates. Why are we able to get away with that? It's because the entire world is scared about their own currencies, so they're lending money to the US to get their money out of the Japanese yen, out of whatever the currency is in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong dollar, out of the English pound, out of the euro, out of the Argentinian peso. They're all, all the wealthiest uh, companies and individuals in the world are lending money to the US because that's a safe place to put their money. But that is also a reason why we all can breathe a sigh of relief that Bitcoin exists. Not that you need to invest in Bitcoin right now, but it's just good to know that it's there just in case the US has a problem. But so will, will the Fed repent for its sins? Who knows, but it's not gonna happen anytime soon. There's a saying that's worked for a hundred years, which is don't fight the Fed. The Fed wants the stock market to go up. Don't fight the Fed. Uh, I don't necessarily believe in all the bailouts either. I've had this argument with people very high up in the Trump administration, which is that the stimulus should go direct to consumers because the consumers, the bottom third really, the bottom third of the economy, they're the ones who spend the most money and they spend it with each other so it, it, it does what it increases the velocity of money. I'll give you a dollar, you give the next person a dollar and so on. So, but the government disagrees with me on this, which is why, again, it's pointless to argue. Like, I've talked to African-American leaders in the past few weeks, I've talked to administration officials, I've talked to economists, billionaires, and I've given my ideas and I've learned from everybody and I've shared ideas and I've given ideas. Nobody listens, which is fine. Maybe I'm wrong about everything, but I decided my goal now is not to persuade anybody of anything because no one's gonna listen. Uh, so uh, Max Hill asked a good question. A few weeks ago, I said, I didn't think Biden would get the Democratic nomination because, and the reason was, is that on predicted.org, uh, which is the uh, gambling market for you, where you can bet on elections, uh, it looked to me like Biden's chances, people were betting against Biden winning the nomination. Not a huge amount, but enough to make me a little bit, there was a spread, like it was, it was almost 100% chance Trump was gonna win the Republican nomination, but there was like an 85% chance only that Biden was gonna win the nomination. So why was there such a difference? So it made me think there's some behind the scenes stuff going on where Biden's not gonna win the nomination. Now, and so I did actually bet against Biden getting the nomination. It was a long shot bet, I was getting seven to one odds, and I'm gonna lose that bet, because it does look like Biden is gonna get the nomination. Unless he dies, he, he has made every single mistake in the book. He has been, uh, he, and, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not saying he's not gonna be a good president, I'm just, I'm looking at this from a betting point of view. You know, Biden had that, that uh, recording with, uh, you know, Charlemagne on the radio show, The Breakfast Club. By the way, I've been on The Breakfast Club. You could, it was just, the video was just put up. If you YouTube Altucher Charlemagne, you'll see our video on The Breakfast Club from a few weeks ago. But Biden, you know, made had that dumb conversation with Charlemagne. Then, you know, Biden's been kind of in hiding and, you know, he keeps making all these gaffes. 
So I thought maybe there was some behind the scenes stuff going on, but now I think Biden's gonna get the nomination. And when I talk to people who are high up in the Democratic Party, they're kind of, they're aware of Biden's cognitive decline, but they're assuming they're gonna help him pick a good VP candidate. By the way, I'm gonna lose money on my bet on the VP candidate. I picked the Atlanta mayor, uh, you know, uh, I think Keisha Bottoms, and then the Atlanta thing happened on Friday, so now her odds have gone down. I'm messing up all my election bets. Hopefully I won't, hopefully I won't go broke betting on the elections. Um, Oh, okay, here's a question uh, uh, from from somebody. Uh, hi, James, your podcast has been life-changing, opening my mind to information and new ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, he says, I have a FDA-approved handheld medical device that can analyze your body in five minutes and tell you what's wrong with you and then give you programs to treat your symptoms, turning your bad cells into good cells through frequencies most chronic symptoms gone in a couple of days. That sounds amazing, by the way. So yeah. I don't know if it's true, but it says, he says he's FDA approved. I don't know, you know, medical device doesn't have the same level of approval as a drug. So I don't know if that means he can market it saying all these things that it cures your chronic diseases or whatever, or sometimes you can start selling a device just when it's approved for safety because it's not as dangerous as a drug. So again, I don't know. We only, it says it's just a text. Um, and he asked though how to market it. And so again, the other day I talked about what the most important word for marketing is right now. So a few, like a year ago, if you wanted to market something, maybe you would say, you would talk about the benefits, like, you know, and benefits always change, but maybe you would say, if you buy this, you'll get rich. Or if you buy this, you'll have a luxurious experience for less dollars or whatever. It was all about luxury and riches and looking good and being an influencer and whatever. Now the key word, the most important, number one word for marketing by far is safety. So he could market a device like this uh, using Facebook ads and say, look, safety comes first. You know, this device, you know, you know, click here to see examples, this device will keep you away from coronavirus, will cure diseases, and will tell you all of your symptoms in five minutes. People will click on that, and then he has, he can use the rules of copywriting. They'll land on the landing page, use the rules of copywriting. Is this urgent? Yes, because a second wave of coronavirus might be coming, or already is here. Is this useful? Yes, because it cures you of all these diseases. Is this unique? Yeah, I've never heard of a device like this before. Is this, um, uh, ultra specific. Yeah, you, he could say yes. If you do this, this, and this, it will cure these seven diseases, and it'll recommend these f programs when these frequencies. And here's how it does it. Um, is it uh, uh, un is there unquestionable proof? So that's a good question. He can have case studies, and he can and he should have doctors. So you need unquestionable proof, and you also need authority. So you need case studies like Janet A from. Kansas City used this device and it cured my symptoms in three days. And then Dr. Kenneth Sokoloff from Harvard uh, says, this is the most amazing device I've ever seen in my 45 years of medical history. So using the techniques of copywriting, and you know what, next week or the week after, I will write a mini course on copywriting and I'll send it out to anybody who texts me. I want people to text me and text my phone, 203-590. 8607, but I will do, because uh, another question is, how can I find a course on copywriting? You don't really need to know a lot, and I will create a mini course for free on copywriting, all the things you need to know, plus extra books you should read, and you know, I'll basically describe everything I went through when I was learning copywriting. And copywriting, different from writing, by the way, very big difference. Copywriting is about selling, writing is about telling a story. And there's an overlap, but not complete. Um, so, so for this person who has this question, sounds like you have a great device. If it's true, there's very simple ways to market it. Another thing you could do is rent an email list. So go to newsmax.com, which is a, a, a news organization. I don't even know if the magazine still exists anymore, but they have a huge email list with like millions of people. And you could buy a subset of that email list and test out different ads. Like you write a copywritten letter, and, and they'll send your letter out to millions of people, but 
test out on a thousand people first, then if it works, test out on 10,000, test out two different letters, so you split test. Testing is the key to marketing. Don't ever forget that. Even if you're the best copywriter in the world, write three letters and test them all. And write to different demographics, see do men buy this, do women buy this, do old people buy this, do young people buy this. You always have to test. Test everything when you're marketing. So, anything you'd add to that? No. Just you would use that though, right? I would. Yeah, I would use it. Great. Sounds great. Sell it to me. <laughs> uh, uh, what suggestions would you give to any church or house of faith to thrive during this COVID slash protest crisis? Oh gosh. Well, that seems, that would be, it seems easy. I mean, people are wanting safety and their faith, you know, that's probably going to get them through a lot of this. So I would probably, you know, have smaller groups meet, not because of, you know, the spread of, of COVID, but okay, that too. But just so that it's more intimate because some of these congregations are really large. So maybe if you, if you make it more in people's homes or, uh, you know, branch off and do smaller groups so that people are able to talk. Yeah, that's such a great idea. So, so the question again is, if you have a, a church or a house of faith, how can you, you know, churches and houses of faith, they're not quite businesses, of course, but they do need to, uh, on a weekly basis, raise money and, and you know, sell things. And, and just they, say, to, say uh, to not forsake yourselves gathering together during anything. So don't forsake yourself gathering together. So it's very important to keep together right to keep the faith mm -hmm. so so but here's what I would do because there are regulations they have been closing down churches and stuff so here's what I would do if I was a church or a house of faith first off I mentioned the word safety but there's another word that's also extremely important for marketing right now if you're if particularly if you're a, a small business and that's local so I would have the uh, let's say it's a, a Catholic church or let's say whatever I would have the, the priest or the reverend or the minister go to the houses of the primary practitioners or whoever will open their doors for you because there is this lockdown in many states, go to your primary practitioners or call them, keep in touch with them, make reach out to them every day, spend a few hours a day directly meeting your top practitioners. And if it's, if you can't do it, you have your sub, I don't know what they're called. Overseers the, or the, your... the sub priests or sub ministers or assistant ministers mm -hmm. or whatever. The other thing is, um, in terms of safety, I would start having Zoom meetings and I would make sure everyone in the Zoom meeting knows your Venmo account so that, uh, you know, set up a Venmo account so that they can tithe or give you, you know, money uh, through Venmo. But very important to have um, a very active Zoom services, very important to reach out locally to the community. And the other thing is too, don't forget to share the stories of people in the community. So, you know, when I go to a church, one thing they do at the end of the ceremony is they say, let's keep in mind our, our thoughts are with so-and-so who's in the hospital right now. Our thoughts are with so-and-so who's in the army right now. Uh, oh, and congratulations to so-and-so, it's their 95th birthday. So keep in touch with the community, keep sharing stories. Share the stories of people who are, who, you know, our hearts are out for, you know, Mary and, and Jack, they're, they're, Jack had coronavirus and they can't see their children for three months. You know, there's a GoFundMe for this local restaurant that's locked down and the employees are out of work. Be a really strong part of the community. Make sure you're the source for community information. And that's, that's so important, safety and local. And the other thing is, use this as an opportunity to get your email list going. Every church, every small house of faith should have an email list and start sharing stories that you think are related to, you know, stories not only from your own faith, but maybe other faiths that are related to this virus. Show that you're, you're inclusionary. Nobody needs to be, if, just because you're not a member of our faith, you could still hear our stories. And you know what, maybe if I was a minister of a church, I would tell stories not only of Jesus, but of Buddha, of Gandhi, of other faiths, and tell their stories. Like, you know, talk about Gandhi's peaceful protests, which, you know, he took over a billion population country because of peaceful protests and how Martin Luther King learned from Gandhi and how Gandhi learned himself from Leo Tolstoy. Talk about 
how how Confucius, his analects of Confucius, how he used those to help run a government. Talk even about you know how you know Malcolm X when he switched to Islam, he switched from kind of a philosophy of more violence to a philosophy of more peace, and he kind of was more hand in hand with Martin Luther King after that. So share stories. Jesus, there's so many stories about Jesus and disease and even pandemics. Share those stories. There's also stories about Jesus. You know, you know, judge not lest you be judged. So you could talk about how in this time of hate and polarization, we mustn't judge. And here's a story. So, but not only that, instead of talking it, it's time for action. So this is a time where, you know, you know instead of, you know, talking the talk, you walk the walk. And you actually are doing things for your people and, and doing things for your community because your church is your community. So mm. this is really yeah. very important to put you know, to go into action, not just a lot of talk, because yeah, people talk, talk, but it's now time to do something for, for everybody and, and to take care of each other. You know, not the time to like, okay, how much money can I make? But there are people that are scared. People don't have money. People can't eat. So this is, a, this is really an important time for churches to really, you know, start doing something. Because a lot of churches sometimes don't, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's and important. So yeah, and, and in terms of like what you can do, so in New York City, and we've even participated in this, churches are once a week forming food banks. So people who are hungry can show up online and we help socially distance the line so that the sh police wouldn't shut it down and you distribute food. And, uh, and that's you, tithing too. I mean, yeah. it doesn't have to be money. You can tithe your, your time. You could tithe, you know. And people want food. to help. You can do anything. So it's not just money. It's about spending time with people and helping everybody. And, and, and people want to help. So if you ask your parishioners to help with something, they will help. People want to help. They don't want to sit at home all day while people are hurting. In general, people are good people and want to help and participate, whether they're a member of your faith or not. Again, be inclusionary. This is the time to be inclusionary and use this as an opportunity to spread the message while you're helping people. Another thing is, if you're doing Zoom services, invite the local police chief to talk about the situation. Or your invite African American leaders to talk about the situations, or your neighbors to talk about the situation. Invite local doctors from the local hospital to talk about how to best, uh, you know, avoid coronavirus or what to do if you have symptoms. So again, be more than just your, be bigger than your religion, which okay. should really be the biggest thing, but be bigger in, than it and, and be the main source in your community. And you know what? This applies not only to churches and houses of faith, this applies to restaurants, this applies to clothing stores, this applies to comedy clubs. Get your customers to tell their stories, outreach into the community. Talk to the local newspapers and tell them what you're doing because they're dying for content too. So. Uh, you know, local and safety are the key words. If all you remember from this is the words local and safety and, and, and being active, then you will, you will have an effective marketing strategy. I hate to always be strategic because there's, there's good intentions behind it too, but I'm also thinking strategically like how I would think if I was desperate and scared that my church was going to run out of money or whatever. Um, Next question. You know, and two, during World War II, there, there were times where uh, churches couldn't, uh, you know, come together. So they did meet underground. And, and a lot of, like, even Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of different religions did that. So they continued to worship, but not in their, you know, synagogues or their What? Churches. Jehovah's Witnesses were not allowed to worship? No, they were actually in the concentration camps too, Jehovah's Witnesses. In the U.S.? No, in Germany. Oh, oh, in Germany, yes. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so uh, Jews as well would have meet in yeah. local prisoners' homes. Right. Right. So, yeah, again. So this is sort of, not that it's this time, but I'm just saying it's a crisis and they're not letting you go to church and they're not letting it, you know, bring it to your home. Yeah. Yeah. If that's possible, like depending on the rules of the lockdown and so on. But I love the advice of doing something active and helpful in the community, yeah. as well as the Zoom, as well as sharing stories even more than before. And, and so on. This is a time to give rather than to take. That's right. So just use your idea. At this point, I hope everyone's, I know it's not the same people here every time, but I always talk about, I don't, I don't, it's not just a platitude for me. 
when I write 10 ideas a day down, it's not because I use those ideas that day to create 10 businesses. It's because I'm exercising the idea muscle. So when a situation like this happens, I do have a strong idea muscle to come up with good ideas. So use your idea muscle and, and, and start, this is the time now you've been preparing for, that you've been exercising. I also call it, I don't just call it the idea muscle, I call it the possibility muscle. Because sometimes you want to list ideas, sometimes you want to list possibilities. You want to know all the possible futures in front of you. Right now, let's assume for a second, I'm just gonna get science fiction-y for a second. Let's assume you believe that everything that could ever happen splits off into different universes, a multiverse, and some physicists believe this. Uh, you can choose, because those universes don't exist yet, but this universe we live in will split into an infinite number of universes, you can choose right now, by your attitude, by your ideas, by your health, which of these universes in this alternate universe theory that you can move into. And that's what the possibility muscle helps you with. By exercising that possibility muscle, you literally create the possibilities that you could then inhabit. So it sounds corny, but... But I mean, when you do things for people, when you do help them, and it's like, doesn't it release serotonin or something? You know, yeah. It's a chemical release also that it's a... I don't know what it releases. Is it serotonin or is it the... Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know which one. So, so I spoke on, on the podcast, we spoke to Dr. Andrew Huberman, who's a neuroscientist at Stanford. And so serotonin, a lot of people who are depressed are depressed because they're lacking serotonin. So they take drugs that are called SSRIs, which are uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and uh, you know, Prozac is one. Uh, I don't know what the other ones are uh, anyway. But uh, uh, a lot of antidepressants boost your serotonin. And what serotonin does is it makes you happier with where you are here and now. Serotonin is like the here and now drug. Dopamine, which Lane just mentioned, dopamine is you get excited about more. Oh, I got more likes. I got more food. I got more of love from Robin. That's dopamine, is you get excited and happy when you have more, when you, it's the molecule of more. But serotonin, which is more linked to depression and antidepressants, serotonin is the molecule of the here and now. And the best way you can improve your, your appreciation of where you are right now is with gratitude for what you have. Like, I'm grateful we're just, doing this. And, that, and not just gratitude, but actually actions, I would think. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, so, <laughs> so there's a good exercise for this. Um, action's really important. Action is greater than thinking, is what you're trying. But you try have to think first, and then you do. Right, so here's a good exercise. And this, this is an exercise developed by Martin Seligman, who I actually think is a professor at Harvard. He is the founder of the entire field of positive psychology, and he has an exercise specifically to boost the serotonin, and it's called the three blessings. So number, number one, every night, just do it for the next week, and if you don't like it, stop. But if you like it, keep doing it. So every night for the next week, do the three blessings technique as recommended by Professor Martin Seligman, who's written all sorts of books on happiness and positive psychology and so on. He wrote a book called Learning Optimism. I forget all, he's written tons of books. It's called The Three Blessings. First, write down tonight, every night, write down three things that happened today that you're happy for, that happened today. Things that happened today that you're happy for. They don't have to be important things. They don't have to be, you know, I gave birth today or I finished, you know, my novelty. They don't have to be, they could be important things, but they could just be like, oh, I had, you know, Robin gave me, ice cream today and it was great or, or it could be uh you know finally in the in, my internet was broken and finally it, it worked for an hour today so that was a great thing that happened or i didn't look at social media at all today so think of three things that someone did for you i should have mentioned that. think of three things that someone did for you that made you even a little bit happy again they don't have to be big things mm -hmm. robin got me this shirt in the morning and i'm wearing it. that made me happy and then Write down why it made you happy. Oh, it made me happy because she's thinking of me and she knows I'm doing this experiment of just wearing pajamas. And then the third thing is write a letter um, and hand deliver it to the person who made you happy. You know, and, and if you're locked down, save the letter or send an email but it's, or Zoom the person and give the letter. Maybe that's the best if you're, if you're remote. But 
in general, if it happened today, probably I'm physically close to whoever it happened with, and so I could hand deliver it to Robin, or my children, or the mailman, or the UPS guy, or my neighbor, or the waiter at the restaurant, or whatever. So again, write down something that made you happy because someone did something for you. Write down why it made you happy, write it in a letter, and physically deliver it. That's the three blessings. Do it every night for the next week, and that enormously, enormously, they've done all sorts of scientific research. Your serotonin goes through the roof. It's like, it's like twice an antidepressant. Not that you should stop taking antidepressants if you're on them, but just try this for a week, and you might decide you want to continue it. Uh, so, uh, next question. Uh, this comes from Victoria uh, in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, when are you live on Instagram? And right now we're live, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, almost every day. Like we try to do every day. Tomorrow we're gonna be on an airplane, so we won't be able to tomorrow. But in general, every single day, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, not only are we live on Instagram, we save it also on my Instagram account and then we make a podcast out of it, but it's so much better when it's right here with you because I can see questions and we can respond and we can interact. Plus, I see, I've see i heard now many stories of people networking with each other while they're ignoring us, so that's mm -hmm. fine. It's on YouTube. Did you say YouTube? Too? Uh, YouTube also, we save it to YouTube. Um, then this person says, I have read your book, Choose Yourself. What ideas may work in Canada versus the US? Does the country you live in matter anymore? Um, uh, and so on. So the answer is no, the country does not matter. The, the main thing about choose yourself is that no matter where you are, you know, obstacles are created by other people for you. So if someone says, James, you can't do this, well, that's their goal for me. Their goal is, like, like one time I was pitching an idea, and I've talked about this before also, but, but I'll give a different angle. I was pitching an idea to the CEO of HBO. And on the way, while I was walking to his office, I ran into Cindy, who was the head of marketing. And, I t and she said, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm going to visit Jeff Bukas' office, the CEO of HBO. And she said, you can't do that. And so I was, I always have thought about that. Like, why did she mean to say that to me? Because it wasn't, it wasn't that she was giving me advice. It's just that everybody, again, they bring their whole history of fear and stress and anxiety into every conversation. They bring all of those things. And so what she was really giving me was not advice, but she was giving me her goal for me. Her goal for me was to turn around, go back to my cubicle, and go up through the normal channels. And maybe in 20 years, I would be able to pitch the CEO of HBO. That was her goal for me. When somebody tells you, puts an obstacle in front of you, or tells you you can't, Again, that's their goal, it's not your goal. Now, it doesn't mean I can just, like if, if the government says you can't leave your house, I may have a harder time leaving my house. So I'm not gonna go against the law. But I, I, maybe I can achieve my goals in other ways, like I'll do Zoom, or I'll still you know, talk to the CEO of whatever, but I'll do it through Zoom instead of just going to their office, or I'll do it through email, or I'll call them up. So again, if, you're, if you have a well-developed possibility muscle, just because someone says can't to you doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that's their goal, not your goal. So if this person says in British Columbia, uh, different businesses are reopening compared to the US and so on. That's okay. All of those can'ts, all of those obstacles, you should still choose yourself. You should still exercise your possibility muscle, your idea muscle. You should still avoid toxic relationships so you avoid the people who have agendas for you. You should still stay physically healthy. That's how you choose yourself. You should still avoid renting out mental real estate to all the people trying to scare you. That's my version, that's the choose yourself version of spiritual health. And then you'll see the possibilities and the ideas will open up and you'll be able to choose yourself. That's the methodology and then it's like a fill in the blanks. Now I can give specific things, but I don't really know what's happening in British Columbia. If I were to think about it and develop my 10 ideas list, I'd come up with ideas. You could still start an online newsletter. Maybe, you know, I haven't seen any investment newsletters about Canadian stocks. Start an online newsletter about Canadian stocks. The stock market's open every day. Start an online newsletter about real estate in Canada. Start an online newsletter about relationships or about the news or about world events 
or whatever. Or parents or marriage or yeah. there, there are humans everywhere. Make, can do stuff make an online course. Be a virtual assistant. Like yeah. the whole thing right now is we can do remote side hustling and that's a huge trillion dollar industry that's empty right now. Focus on building, you know, last week we spoke, or two weeks ago we spoke about a coronavirus compliance business. Look at flippa.com to see what businesses you might be able to buy cheap in the e-commerce space. So we've spoken about many different types of businesses, you know, listen to these podcasts when they're posted or, or the stored IG lives. And uh, you can always, always, always choose yourself. It doesn't matter what, you could be in the middle of a refugee camp and there's ways to choose yourself. Might be a little bit more difficult in some situations, but it was difficult. It's difficult for all of us sometimes. We've all experienced really horrible suffering where we've flirted with the idea of horrible things. And you know, it's all relative and there's always ways to choose yourself. When you, you dealt with this, when your um, you know, late husband passed away and you had been married for 18 years and you were in the middle of Kuwait and you had to move back to the United States, you, you had no idea what would happen and you, had, you knew you had to choose yourself though. You know, and I'm yeah. sure it was scary. Now, you can't really compare with someone in a refugee camp, but you can because it's all relative. Pain is relative. Yeah. So, uh, another question, one more. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, find a good question. Uh, uh, I talked, I answered about this. Good resources for uh, copywriting. Hey, uh, Chris uh, Damon, uh, hello. Uh, here's another one. Really enjoying the IG Live with Robin. I'm watching every episode, albeit not live. I'm wondering if you have any ideas on how I can monetize my favorite pastime, reading. So this person, she spends hours every day reading and the time flies and is there any way to make money monetizing reading? And um, I'm gonna use my idea muscle. It's the first time I see this question. And so I will come up with a couple ideas for you. So I don't know what books you like to read. Let's say you like to read the classics. Remember when we were kids, Cliff's Notes? Mm -hmm. So Cliff's Notes, if you didn't want to read the book, which I never, like nobody wants to read the Canterbury Tales when they're in ninth grade. Like who, what's the, who's the wife, the, the, the raunchy wife or whatever. And then there's the farmer and the miller and who gives a shit? It's like written in 1200, it was written 800 years ago. So I would buy the Cliff's Notes and I would cheat on the tests. Would you? Um, Do you ever buy the Cliff's Notes? Well, there was another notes too. There was a red uh, one. No, I, I did, but I, I tried, but I don't think I cheated in it. So one thing you can do is every book you read, write another book, which is a summary of the book. So even if it's Fifty Shades of Grey, okay, maybe I don't want to read Fifty Shades of Grey, but I'd love to read a five page book. You can write a five page book and self publish it on Amazon. You could, uh, I could read, I would love to read a five page book about Fifty Shades of Grey. So if I run into someone at a cocktail party and they're like, oh my God, Fifty Shades of Grey is the greatest work of literature ever. Have you read it? I could say, yeah, I've read it. It's about this, this, this. But I always had this question about this because that might be a question from the five page book. Yeah. So you could write five, you know, summary books about the books you've read. Now, I know someone who's done this. Now, and there's millions of books, so you won't do the same book. Like he did it with about a hundred books and he gets a steady check from Amazon every month as people download, oh, David Copperfield, here's a 10 page summary. And there's mm -hmm. tests even, there's a trivia quiz and there's summaries and there's character development and here's the theme and here's the plot. So, or he'll do it with more modern books or he'll do it with nonfiction books. Like, oh, you didn't read, um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point? Well, here's, the cliff notes sort of of the tipping point. Everyone says, oh, did you read Malcolm Gladwell? You know, at the cocktail, if you talk to CEOs, they got like the tipping point on their shelf. Oh, oh, great book. Here's what I liked about it, these three things. Well, that's the thing you read in. So, so okay, idea number one, this person could write book summaries as books, publish them, self-publish them on Amazon and you'll get a check every month. Here's idea number two. You could write, you could set up a book review service. So you could reach out to the authors of recently published books that aren't really selling that well or they don't have a lot of reviews and you could say, hey, not only will I write a review and this is going to be a little unfair or unethical, 
but I will set up a hundred Amazon accounts and I'll write a hundred different reviews for your book. So your book will feel, you know, your book should have every opportunity to be read. And if it has a hundred reviews, there's evidence that it'll sell more copies than if it doesn't have a hundred reviews. And I only charge a thousand dollars to do this, $10 a review. And I'll do that. So you could set up a book review service. So you could do, so, so that's another thing you can do. Um, the other thing you can do is, uh, I mean, there are, uh, magazines like Kirkus or websites, uh, that will pay for book reviews, like 50, $60 for a book review. That's not a lot, but so there's some three initial ideas to start off with. I can guarantee you the first two ideas, you could actually make a living from reading and writing either book reviews or write mini books about the book you just read. Uh, so the other thing you can do is you can do book giveaways. So take a look at the business model for bookbub.com and copy that business model. So they read books, they take their favorite books and they do, and they have a huge email list because they'll do book giveaways and then some people will pay to be on the book giveaway list. So, uh, so more people will read their books. So you so study that business model as well. So that's three ideas for, uh, the person who reads a lot. Uh, any other last minute questions? Uh, so uh, Corey says, Amazon won't let you uh, write a review unless you have spent $50 in the last 90 days. That's true for verified purchases. Not all your reviews have to be verified purchases. I think you just can write a review even if you don't have a verified purchase. But let's even say that's true. Most people have, we've all been locked down, don't forget. We've all spent, we've all probably spent $50 in the past 90 days or 60 days on Amazon. We've bought food on Amazon. We've bought clothes on Amazon. We've bought books on Amazon. When we watch TV, we watch Amazon Prime. We've bought TV shows on Amazon. By the way, we're in the middle of the series. I'm rewatching it. It's her first time. We're watching on Amazon Prime. Uh, I'm Dying Up Here, which is a show about 1970s stand up comedy. And it's on, it's on the Showtime side of Amazon Prime. So we've all spent money on Amazon, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Goodreads would work too. Yes, you could rate uh, and, and even write reviews on, Good, on Goodreads. Like Choose Yourself, I think, has about 2,000 reviews on Amazon and then another 400 rankings on Goodreads. Uh, okay, so, no, so Sarah says no one can write until they've spent 50 pounds, uh, but that's fine. Most people, again, have probably spent 50 pounds and look, if you can make a thousand dollars a month, but you have to spend 50 pounds a month, that's a fair deal. So spend the money if you have the clients and you could kind of, you only have to spend the money when you know you're going to get enough clients. You remember, you're going to charge a thousand dollars for one book to write a hundred reviews. You can get so, money up front maybe. Yeah, you can get money up front or you can get 10 clients. You can make $10,000 a month. Who knows? So that's another way. So again, um, thanks for the questions. Uh, uh, there's been questions on community. I also tried to answer a few questions that I saw spinning down on the Instagram live. Uh, we'll save this on my Instagram feed, on YouTube, and it'll also be a podcast. So you'll, you'll all be part of the podcast, particularly if you ask questions. And I'm particularly answering questions on these IG lives or directly through, through SMS or even in articles or on Twitter. Text me at my phone. My phone number is 203 590-8607. I'm trying to do more texting and communicating through the phone rather than email or all the, there's like Instagram messaging, LinkedIn messaging, blah, blah, blah. I like just text messaging. So 203-590-8607. We're traveling tomorrow. We'll tell you what it's like to travel on a plane and then, you know, traveling in the time of coronavirus. And we'll see you 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday and talk to you later. I hope you have a good weekend. Thanks. And then leave some comments on Twitter or somewhere. We love, she loves reading the comments. She'll read the comments till four in the morning. Thanks very much, everybody.